Everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us. And I'm going to turn things over to our good friend, Edward. Edward, take it away. It's all yours. Okay. Well, I will start again. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Ed Ingebretson. I'm here with Robert. Uh, I wish everyone a good holiday season. Uh, share it with those that you do. Be blessed and graced and all that. The, the topic tonight that I'm going to be looking at is the calling from the point of a literary critic who, who called it the sense of an ending. And it's the question of however good our lives are, we tend to focus on endings of things. This evening, we're looking at the Anthropocene era, which is an epoch in time. We're looking at this world, its animals, including ourselves, and the ruin we make. So I apologize for the dramatic titles. Robert tells me I don't have much time, so I'm going to scamper right into it. The Anthropocene, what does it mean? The Anthropocene and the sixth extinction, most of us would agree as the parish climate accords the state that human thoughtfulness and neglect is literally an apocalypse now happening. At the same time, we think little of ordering a toothbrush from Amazon, and we'll talk about that in a moment, and that we don't see the connection between the toothbrush from Amazon and the apocalypse is kind of the point of the presentation, or as the poet Eliot says, how the world ends. Anthropocene is a Greek word from anthropos, meaning human, and sine, which means beginning now, this time. And it's a term given to a geological era that signals how the world ends. Much of this will be uh, old news to folks. We hear the languages of the uh, five and sixth extinctions, mass extinctions. We're gonna go a little bit into some details on some of them. Uh, pardon me if most of it you have heard before different areas. Uh, on the 1945 atomic bomb test in New Mexico, you see this image here, which for many people, uh, many scientists, is the marker that we are in fact in a period of time where human agency is literally destroying the world. And that, in a sense, is what we mean by the sixth extinction. The five previous ones have been more or less natural. And the sixth is a different kind of nature. It's including us. Robert Oppenheimer, the developer of the atomic bomb, when he saw the Trinity test, he remarked to himself in his diary, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. You'll be seeing a lot of graphs and you can find many of these yourself and I will try not to spend a lot of time with them. A recent estimate of a background rate of two mammal extinctions per 10,000 species per 100 years. That is to say, extinctions happen normally part of life's process. But the scientists say that even under our own assumptions, the average rate of vertebrate species loss over the, just the last century is up to 100 times higher than the background rate. So what you're looking at here uh, very quickly, the red uh, in the graph are creatures or species in either in threat or in extinction. And very quickly, they'll give you mammals, birds, vertebrates, fish, background. So this is what from the 1500s one would expect a normal extinction rate, one or two species per thousand. That's the background. But what we are seeing specifically since the 1800s is a high increase in the loss of mammals, birds, vertebrates, fish. In 2018, David Attenberg warns of, quote, a collapse of civilizations at the United Nations climate meeting. He says, right now we are facing a man-made disaster of global scale, a greatest threat in thousands of years. Climate change, Attenborough said, discussing how, how countries will implement the 2015 Paris Agreement limiting carbon emissions. If we don't take action, the collapse of our civilizations and the extinction of much of the natural world is on the horizon. Again, we have heard much of this, 
That was in 218. This was as late as October 6, 2022, just a few months ago. Quoting UN General Secretary Antonio Guterres, who lambasted, quote, the empty pledges that put us on track to an unlivable world. In a 2021 document, which now has over 14,700 signatories from 158 countries, the scientists state that climate change, not global warming, climate change, would quote, cause significant disruptions to ecosystems, society, and economies, potentially making large areas of Earth uninhabitable. The text defines civilization collapse as the loss of societal capacity to maintain essential government functions, maintaining security, the rule of law, and the provision of basic necessities such as food and water. Civilization collapses in this sense could be associated with civil strife, violence, widespread scarcity, and thus have extremely adverse effects on human welfare. One could pause here and one could say, I have been reading the newspaper and all of these things one can see in the news uh, as we speak in our own government and in our own governance. But I want to come back a little bit to the climate change. And it, it pays to remember that climates change constantly. And I remember Donald Trump, uh, the former president, once remarked, well, I, I don't believe this is human agency, you know, climate changes. But it's true, it does. And in fact, the 13th century, uh, early in the early in the 14th century, what they called the, the the little ice age, which ushered in a hundred years of terrible weather and conditions, and brought on mostly by volcanic materials, uh, which many people will pause will will suggest is one of the reasons for the 1348 uh, bubonic plague, the, what we know as the, as the Black Death. So we have these kinds of moments. And the times change, and people looking at the say the history of, of say the medieval Europe note that under certain periods of time, of a whole swaths of the country were able to be harvested and agriculturally good, and in hundreds of years elsewise, they weren't. So what we are talking about this evening specifically will be how a specific kind of agency happens that is different from what we would expect, the background the ecosystems of nature. Very quickly, a prologue, items in the news recently. And I will say in advance, some of the images that we're seeing might be disturbing in terms of uh, particular kinds of animal loss and life. These are all headlines in different places, CNN. Sea levels rise faster than predicted, displacing 187 million people. You see two maps, one said 1979 and 2011. You can see here the fullness of the map, and here you can see, and even in 2022, as we're going to come to, how much more quickly you're seeing um, large layers of ice and glaciers. This, for example, is 2022, and you're looking at it direct down from the North Pole, and you're seeing an, an immense amount. Uh, Greenland is now, they're farming. They're, they're now growing strawberries for, um, uh, for product in a way that they could never have done before. Um, you know, and the indigenous speaks, spokesperson for Greenland said, well, we've adapted to climate changes before. We will adapt to this one. So in itself, climate change is, is nothing that, that causes, should cause more alarm than that it should be in, as uh, uh, Tim Canley Robinson's book, uh, Ministry for the Future, takes, we should be taking that into account. But, but the question that we're posing here, and what the, the, that the Anthropocene poses is, how much of this is human agency? And part of what we, uh, we'll see here is that there are certain kinds of animals, and in all the news broadcasts, you'll see uh, that there is a certain kind of slant to a certain kind of animal, usually they're bears and they're elephants and they're kangaroos, um, because they are mammals like us and we can identify with them. Uh, and there's a kind of a cute factor in this. So there's a there's a play in terms of the advertisement in, in the media to kind of catch our attention. And you're going to find that most of the material that I'm bringing up here uh, 
says little about the varieties of ways in which human agencies in terms of food, dress, entertainment uh, affect animals. And that's a different, that's a different presentation perhaps. But so on this point from the UN, uh, another study from the UN paints a bleak picture of the planet. It warns one million of the planet's eight million species face the threat of extinction because of human activity. This is tens to hundreds of times higher than it's been over the last 10 million years. So we remember the terrible fires in 2019 out in mid-south coast of New South Wales in uh, Australia. A fire crisis that wiped out nearly half a billion animals. You've heard these particular statistics that the world is set to reach a 1.5 centigrade level within the next two decades. And the, 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 the point, the, the figure that folks have been thinking about is that, that if the world reached an average temperature of 1.5 centigrade, 2.2 to Fahrenheit degrees, above pre-industrial levels, that is to say 1850, uh, there is a kind of a two centigrade or two, say, uh, two, two Fahrenheit degree window there where people can still survive. But beyond that, forests start to die off. As temperatures continue to rise, forests could begin to die off. Trees play a part in observing CO2. Sea levels rise. So in the 2022 report is that the world is set to reach this figure within the next two decades, even 10 years ago, that figure was not supposed to be reached until 2100. So the only most drastic cuts in carbon emissions from now would help prevent an environmental disaster. Now we're gonna pass on, none of us here is experts in carbon emissions, except to know that we hear that's coal, that's driving, that's electrical, um, a little known statistic will be farming and how much of simply farm animals raise in terms of carbon emission. Very recently, uh, April in 22, record high temperatures spark avalanche in Italy's largest alpine glacier collapses. So this isn't material that is just happening in Alaska and just happening in Greenland. But this is, for many of us, closer to home. It's in, it's, in the, it's in Europe, it's in the US, and we're going to be looking at flooding here in a moment. Boston, for example, scientists said could see up to 18 days of high tide flood, floods, causing street flooding in 2022. Uh, this is Back Bay, for those of you who are, are familiar with Boston. And again, this is kind of the background. We, we've heard this ever since you know, the various kinds of, of hurricanes from 2012 all the way through, even to Irma and back more recently into Miami. And we'll see that we may not be paying a lot of attention to that uh, unless we have property. And you can Google properties on the coast of any particular country, uh, including kind of not far from where I'm uh, locating my, my uh, presentation from this evening, where they had a house on the beach that was literally up, being held up by three, three poles. But you look at a picture like this and you go, oh, um, I know people who live here. A headline, can New York be saved in the era of global warming? NPR. These hurricane flood maps reveal the climate future for Miami, New York City, and DC, not to mention New Jersey. And this is uh, July 28th, just recently. Tim Stanley Robinson, if you, uh, if you like activist science fiction, his book, 2140, um, um, President Obama has a, has a comment on one of his books, and I end with that. So a reviewer says, to save the city, we had to drown it. And um, so Robinson's book, it looks at, at the city in which uh, the flood levels has gone up 50 feet, 15 meters, he says. And so most of the buildings, all the buildings are, it's like Venice. And so you now have uh, the, the upper levels of the city or where you have what they have, the, the Highland Walk in, uh, in San Francisco. So, but the, 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 the bottom of the street levels is simply impassable. Uh, this isn't fiction. This is Miami, and this is two months ago. A, a gentleman ha had to walk home to get his uniform to go to work 
and he was walking down the middle of the street and the, had put the uniform in a bag so that it wouldn't get wouldn't get wet. Okay. You know, the impact on climate change on our planet's animals, and again, here's the notion of where you see uh, certain animals, and, you know, uh, elephants are one of the one of the five top most sentient, if you can call it that way, most intelligent species. Um, and what we do with elephants, even in captivity in terms of zoos, is not to be talked about here, but um, there's a certain tug that makes on us and to take one example, as these creatures have been steadily exterminated, as a word, over the past 100 years, uh, if rate, rates of habitat loss and fragmentation due to human development, now this isn't eating food, this isn't wearing food, this is entertainment, this is simply human development. This is called deforestation, more condos, bigger buildings, and moving into places um, where typically other sentient creatures have lived and global warming or climate change continues, combined with deaths from poaching, and I have my final image is one of that, we can lose Africa's elephants in the next 40 years. You know, and, and in the sea zoo, for example, which is a fairly enlightened zoo, you go down to the elephant cage and you see um, a creature who typically in the wild would spend most of the day roaming 40 miles back and forth. And this creature has maybe 300 yards or 200 yards to walk around in. The Arctic is warming about twice as fast as the global average, causing the ice that polar bears depend upon to melt away. And there's all kinds of reasons for this. The tools that they use to track the ice, uh, that the more ice melts, the, the more the closer it gets to the ground, the warmer it gets. And so it simply picks up ice. The, the, the point about Greenland becoming no longer an ice bound economy, but one that now actually begins to kind of have the same kind of agricultural fertility as uh, parts of uh, the, the wide open uh, parts of France. Back to Australia's Black Summer 186 square kilometers or 72,000 square miles. Um, this terrible image below of a kangaroo who gets got stuck in a fence and burned to death there. So this the sixth mass extinction is in process, and we're going to go back and we're going to talk a little bit about what this kind of um, jargony language is. But we're experiencing the quickening of a an extinction event in which. Uh, more and more and more, we're seeing loss of life that will not be repeated, the likes of which have not been seen on Earth since for at least 65 million years. You remember the film Jurassic Park. Well, the, 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 uh, the, the year 65 million years goes back to the Jurassic era, which is where that title comes from. So this is the alarming finding, and it's not new to anybody at this particular point. To repeat, a conservative estimate of the background extinction rate for all vertebrate animals is two extinctions per 10,000 species per 100 years. This is the background. The current rate is estimated at 100 to 1,000 times higher for vertebrates, mammals, and birds. The researchers call it biological annihilation. Studies reveal billions of populations of animals have been lost. It's nearly 177 half of the mammal species surveyed lost more than 80% of their distribution between 1900 and 2015. Now, distribution means where they can live. And we'll see a statistic later, a map, we'll see a map where what used to be called 50% of, of the global mass would have been wild land or a natural land is now down to 25%. So uh, the, con the, the, the concept of biodiversity, sorry, I'm missing up, which we're talking about here, talks about the various ways we think about it this way, in terms of when you're thinking about per, uh, persons uh, or human genes and intermarriage, and we talk about incest, and you, get, you have to broaden out the gene pool. So biodiversity is something like that. And it's, it suggests that biota, uh, the diversity of living things, depends on temperature, 
precipitation and population. Um, we we kind of know anecdotally that most of the biodiversity is along in this particular area and that in the greener areas, it's less. To keep in mind that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever lived on Earth, amounting to over 5 billion species, are estimated to be extinct. We don't know about anything about them except what we can find in, in, in the fossil records. Estimates more to the point on the number of Earth's current species range from 10 million to 14 million, of which 1.2 million have been documented and over 86% have not yet been described. That's an astonishing perspective. And we don't think about that, but that uh, animals come out whenever they come out that we have never seen or recognized whether they're below the water so the animals that we know, again, the polar bears and that the, the three or four that we keep, we keep seeing in the news, um, there's 86% of species in the world that have yet to be in any kind of way taxonomized. So if you want to put some of this information into a graph, so since 1900, the expected decline of mammals would have been 1.26 per thousand. Instead, it's 35, 2.38 per thousand, 57. Mammals do better, or reptiles do better. Amphibians do slightly better. Fish, they don't. And there's all kinds of reasons because of the, the acidification of the ocean. Back to the news again, as events in our world and country and city have shown us in the last few months, and I, you know, you can think about uh, the incursion into the U Ukraine. You're wondering, how is it possible that a civilization can be doing this? It's a fragile planet. Uh, pardon my politics, folks. Uh, we are a fragile people. We share this fragility with, as the BBC reports, an astonishing 8.7 million species of flora and fauna. Uh, to cut to the chase, we are one of the fauna. So later on, you're going to see me talking about non-human animals. We are, since 1557, been put back into the biological strata as an animal. And this BBC report was in 2009. Many animals may be long extinct even before they can be identified. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature's Red List, critically endangered. 42,000, endangered, 6,000, vulnerable, 10,000, newly threatened, 4,000, least concern, 32, no, no data, 11. Again, to repeat the data, world to lose two thirds of wild animals by 2025. We say that can't be right, but it can be the dire circumstances for the world's wild animals, warning that two thirds of vertebrate populations could be wiped out by 2025 based on 1970 population models. Index found that animal populations dropped by 58% between 1970 and 2012. I, I, again, back to the, to the incursion, the war in the, in the Ukraine, uh, how callously not only human animals are being taken care of, but the non-human animals in, let's say, the, the Kiev Zoo, if, if anyone has been tracking that. Um, and then we can talk about terms of animals in the use of animals as pets in the United States and how many end up in shelters. So I'm, I'm blurring a, a line here, but just to, just to remind ourselves that the animal population is dropping by 58% between 1970 and 2012. In some cases include human beings, although human populations tend to increase largely as a result of human activities from poaching to habitat loss and pollution. Again, here, uh, the human activities that these kinds of reports tend to focus on, and I'm gonna critique them in this case, tend to be things that obscure human agency when it comes time in terms of eat, food, entertainment, and the other way that animals, uh, would, we, we dress in them, uh, the devastation on animal lives because of the, the clothing that we wear, the furs that we wear, the, the devastation done to uh, basically uh, 
uh, on, on farm animals in terms of meat and dairy. So my question, and I ask this in a different in an ethical context in another different class, do we think we owe these creatures a moral obligation of any kind? And they say, well, like, they can't fulfill a contract. Well, we owe moral obligations to our children too, and that they can't fulfill contracts. But Western culture and its mix of theologies generally positions animals as subservient to humans. Abavadatque adam nominibus suis quinta procura et procura et universa et volatilia celi et omnes bestias agri. And then Adam gave names to all the animals of the land, all the animals of the air, and all the beasts of the sea. The ownership. And then we see something just as recently as yesterday. Huge Berlin aquarium bursts, unleashing flood of devastation. Mayor Francisca Giffey says the tank had unleashed, quote, a veritable tsunami of water, but the early morning timing had prevented far more injuries. Despite all the destruction, we were still very lucky, she said. We would have had terrible human damage had the aquarium burst even an hour later. Once more people were awake and in the hotel and the surrounding area, she said. I looked in vain for any reference to the fish in this event. We don't think of these other creatures, their adjuncts to our lives, our pleasures, and our happiness. So let's go back, a little cosmic history. Um, this is the way the world end, ended. And there are five of them typically, and I'm sure we will have seen these maps and uh, some of them uh, allude to a recent film, we'll talk about them, to remind ourselves that extinction is the dying out of a species, it's a natural phenomenon. More than 90% of all organisms that have ever lived on Earth aren't alive. But human agency has made it worse, and uh, in, in that's kind of the argument and all the back and forth around uh, global change and, and, and that sort of thing accelerating natural extinction rates due to our role in habitat loss, climate change, invasive species, disease, overfishing, and hunting. If you drive up and down 95 during October, November, and you see the awful slaughter on the road of animals, and it's, it's a case, no one makes a deal of it. And, and we say, well, but you know, it's a it's the price we paid that we that we can have 95 going up and down between New Jersey and, and DC. But it, it's that kind of sense, and I go back to the fish in Berlin, is that um, there's a notion that Adam named all these creatures and there's a kind of a, what they would call dominion over them, which is kind of a misreading of the, of the Old Testament of, the, of the, that particular text, but that gives us some kind of power to not only aim, name them, but then to hold them in submission. So, but what is an extinction event? It's, it's a biotic crisis. It's an extinction event is classified as a chain of events. And again, as we'll talk later about climate change, climate change itself does not do all of these sorts of things, but it's a chain of events that cascades into other failures of systems during which an inordinate amount of life on the planet ceases to exist. Events can take a long time and affect a small proportion of planetary life, the thawing of an ice age. And I go back again to the 13th and 1400s where much of Europe uh, experienced a dieback. Uh, and only in the 15th and the 16th, which we'd call the Renaissance, did you begin to see a, a, a large movement towards a more positive uh, ecosystem throughout Europe. Or they mean cataclysmic and violent extraterrestrial impacts like and blot out the sun, and we'll talk about that in a moment. To date, science believes that we have had five of these. I'm going to go back here. The Ordovician in 450 million years ago, 70% extinct. Okay, but by and large, that's mostly um, one cell items, uh, creatures in the sea. The Devonian, 375. And you can see here how that looks, 70% extinct. The two that we know, the Permian-Triassic extinction event, 251 million years ago, were 95% 
life extinct, that all creatures living today emerged since then out of about 4% or 5% of the survivors, what they call the great dying. The Triassic, Jurassic, 200 million years, 75% extinct, and then 65 million, this is really recent history in some ways, what they call the KPG uh, extinction, were 75% extinct, uh, and mostly the dinosaurs, mammals and birds survive. Uh, to go back to this, for example, and we'll talk a little bit about gold spikes, and we'll talk about how these different eras are decided. That this is, if you go to the, let's say the, if you can remember what the, uh, uh, what a, looking at rock that water has gone through, and you see the gradations in the rock, and you see like the Grand Canyon, and you can actually look at it, you can see they're different, it's like a layer, <laughs> see different colors. Uh, that each one of those layers of rocks uh, can be read, they are legible. And so that every epoch that changes, they can see it in the fossil record, they can see it in the stone record, and we'll see that. So the biota crisis is a widespread decrease in biodiversity. Why is it important? Uh, as I was talking a moment ago about what they would call the gene pool, uh, with a, without a wide range of animals, that every animal exists in a certain um, particular area and thrives according to a certain climate, a certain temperature, a certain niche. And if animals of different kinds vacate that niche, then without a wide range of animals, plants, and microorganisms, we don't have the healthy ecosystems that we rely on to provide us with air number one, and the food that we eat. Um, if, you want, if you want to look at terrestrial hotspots of biodiversity, you'll notice that they're all along the coast. And you'll also notice that if you had to put a map of where uh, human uh, development is, most of that is also along the coast. So there's something what they would call a perfect storm that uh, human animals tend to live in areas that are diversely in, inhabited. And these particular areas tend to be on coastal areas, which as the water level and climate changes change, begin to rise. Ice here melts, ice here melts. This level rises so you can begin to see what's gonna go first. So, and this is, this is the fact. There's an estimated 8.7 million plant and animal species, 86% land species, 91% of sea species still remain undiscovered. And you can probably once or twice a week, there will be a narrative of someone catches some kind of creature that they don't know what it is. Um, and they'll call it Yeti or they'll call it Bigfoot or they'll call it something or they'll, they'll catch a, a fish and will it be Loch Ness? Uh, there's half a chance that this could be something that has not been seen before. But of the ones we do know, 1,200 mammal, 1,400 bird, 1,200 reptile, 2,000 amphibian, 2,300 fish species are considered threatened. Known causes of animal extinctions since 1600. Again, notice the prejudice. Hunting, 23%. Species introductions, 39%. Habitat destruction, 36%. We're going to come back to this because if you do any work in colonial studies, one of the dates that they're going to be talking about, and you see it here, they don't mention by and large in any of this colonialism or the, the, they'll mention the Columbian exchange once or twice, but uh, one of the drivers for the sudden wholesale removal of world possibility has been colonialism and capitalism. Recent studies suggest that extinction threatens approximately a million types of plants, in large parts because of human activities such as deforestation, hunting, and fishing, as we've seen. Severe dangers include the spread of intrusive species, diseases from human trade, in addition to contamination, human-caused environmental change, and of course, again, food and dress and entertainment, and the other ways in which we subject animals to our will. You, you see in the newspaper, you'll see, uh, Somebody, a, a giant turtle takes away a baby in in, in Florida, and you know it, you 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 pass over that, 
and you wonder how this how this could happen. But as a matter of fact, I mean, so people will have will, will buy their children pets, I mean, the turtles or be the small lizards or, or or small alligators, and they don't know what to do with them, and so they turn them and they re they release them. So the spread of intrusive species and diseases. Uh, if you are a plant person in, in say in the West Coast and you know Appalachian and you know the trees, you know the chestnut uh, and the, you know the dying the chestnuts and you know kudzu the kudzu vine. So we we know and you people talk about pigeons being kind of species from Europe, or, and the, the the grackle and rabbits and squirrels and black squirrels and the black squirrels. So we we talk like this all the time, but we don't ever think about the fact that there are these creatures in places where they weren't intended to be, uh, the rabbits, for example, in, in uh, Australia, and how, or even wolves, which were by federal law mandated to be killed in 1920s in the uh, free ranging wolves in Yellowstone, which now in Michigan are now basically taking over because they, they, have, no, they have no competition. So if a species has a unique function in its ecosystem, its loss can provide and prompt cascading effects to the food chain, a trophic cascade impacting other species and the ecosystem itself. This is interesting, and I myself actually was, was kind of startled by it, but biodiversity losses caused by humans tend to be more severe. Half of the world's habitable land has been converted to agriculture. Half of the world's habitable land has been converted to agriculture. Some 77% of agricultural land is used for grazing by cattle, sheep, goats, and other livestock. Uh, Jared Diamond's Guns, Diamonds, and Steel talks about how our agriculture itself was uh, and heck, you go back to the Bible in terms of Adam and Eve and the, uh, the farmers and the hunters. Um, there's, a, there's a certain economy in that narrative, but it's also the economy is a certain true one. But, uh, but the point on this is that, and it's a statistic we'll see in a moment ago, in a minute, um, this massive conversion of forests and wetlands and grasslands and other terrestrial ecosystems has produced a 60% decline in the number of vertebrates worldwide since 1970. The other fact, between 1970 and 2014, the human population grew from 3.7 billion to 7.3 billion people. By 2018, the biomass of humans, basically weighing all the people in the world, and their livestock greatly outweighed the biomass of wild mammals and wild birds. This is an astonishing thing when you think about it. All the animals that still exist, wild animals, and for our purposes, there are uh, a wonderful book called Zoopolis. Uh, they talk about a political, a political economy of animals. And uh, the authors talk about, well, there are certain animals that basically travel with us. And they're deer and the squirrels and their sparrows and their pigeons. And where we go, they go. Uh, and the Norwegian black rat, thank you, which they, they use in, in, in laboratories. Um, and then there are other animals, wild animals, that we, the ones that you would see in zoos. All the wild animals that still exist, the biomass, this is what's left. This is livestock. So um, back, to, back to the Bible in Genesis. Um, when the text says in Genesis uh, 129, all of these, all of these, uh, I give you for food, the King James Version translates the word into meat. Uh, but the, the text does not give us, he says, anything that has blood in it, you are not to eat. All those, all these green things that have seeds, you are to eat. So th that kind of conversation, but if one were to stop eating meat, how that in itself would change. A different way of putting this, and then when you think about 10,000 years ago, this little line was human biomass. This was wild animal. Today, 32% human, 1% wild animals, 60% livestock. Who consumes most? We don't have to spend a lot of time on this. 
Um, the darker colors are the consumptions and the lighter colors are those who, um, for reasons that go not only into diet, but who, who have less. Exploding human consumption causes a massive drop in global wildlife population. The World Wildlife Federation says losses in vertebrate species, mammals, fish, birds, amphibians, reptiles, 60% between 1970 and 2014. Earth is losing biodiversity. So again, this is not simply uh, individual animals, although it is that, but it, it's the possibility and the depth and the ability to have more of them. Biodiversity at a rate seen only during mass extinctions. So uh, to repeat the, the Ordovician, small marine mammals, late Devonian, tropic mammals, uh, marine species, the great die off of the Permian, largest mass extinction event, Triassic, Jurassic, the extinction of other vertebrates, and 66 million years ago, the one most recent to us, the extinction that occurred wiped out some 50% of plants and animals. So how one thinks about all these things? Uh, we're going we're to look at two, actually. Uh, the Permian tri Triassic extinction, considered the worst in all history because around 96% of species lost, probably caused by an enormous volcanic eruption that filled the air with carbon dioxide, which fed different kinds of bacteria that, that began emitting large amounts of methane. The earth warmed, the oceans become acidic. 60,000 years ago, 96% of all marine species and about three of every four types on land died out. And again, if you track through European history, uh, I say European rather than say um, histories of the Americas, because as a matter of fact, there, there was not enough um, documentation in terms of, uh, in terms of the Americas of, of how climate affected. Um, in 1512, when Hernando Cortez uh, took over the Aztecs, Mexico City was one of the large, was, was way larger uh, than London is even today. But over about 60,000 years, but so life today descends from the 4% of surviving species. But when you, when you go through and you, you track the climate of Europe and you start kind of tracking hot, cold, um, the volcanic activity, wars and uh, uh, civilizations, there is a, a direct uh, chaos, for example, by David Keyes actually looks at the, the weather since uh, the, uh, the, the fifth century and tracks the, the, the major cultural events in Europe and, will, and shows how the climates themselves affected the land. And what's interesting uh, for this, and this is we're gonna talk about, um, we, we, you know, we, we have recently this narrative of, of asteroids hitting Earth. The Triassic extinction event estimated more than half the known species it, it's also one that looks to be from a series of, this is the Manicougan Reservoir in Canada, which lies within the remnant of an ancient impact crater. But there's a whole series of them. It was suggested that it may have been part of a multiple impact event. Um, the Rochechart in France, the St. Martin Crater in Manitoba, Obalon Crater in Ukraine, the Red Wing Crater in North Dakota. The one 66 million years ago, probably the most well-known, probably for the wrong reasons, of major extinction events brought on the extinction of the dinosaurs. And, you know, so the, again, you're talking with the Jurassic Park era, a combination of volcanic activity, asteroid impact, and climate change effectively ended 76% of life. This extinction period allowed for the evolution of mammals on land and sharks and seas. We're going to talk for the next couple of slides about um, there is debate on this and that the asteroid, um, the ready kind of going to the asteroid narrative might actually be uh, inappropriate. And we'll talk about that. But there, in the a range of species, the best known non-avian also destroyed myriad terrestrial organisms, mammals, birds, lizards, insects. 75% of all species on Earth vanished. Here's where it gets interesting. At least it gets interesting because it becomes easily teachable and we can say, oh, I get it. So now I understand that, that really I have to pay attention to things falling on me from the sky. 
Um, this goes back to 1984 and what they call the Alvaro, the Alvarez thesis. This uh, new finding shows Yucatan Peninsula asteroid, a warmed planet for 100,000 years. This was a 1991 set of research. And we're going to see this, that uh, the asteroid hit here. You can kind of see where you are. Um, and we can say, oh, yeah, well, this is what it did. So there's a kind of narrative uh, that we know, we, we, in terms of reading the newspaper, we read narratives that we already know the answers to, whether, so we need to go to read about the royal family, we need to go read about Trump, or, because we know what's happening, and it's it's like a serial novel. Um, so here, in to talking about asteroids, is that, oh, yeah, well, so now I understand it. So the Chicxulubo uh, crater, there's a broad consensus that this was an asteroid rather than a comet. Again, I, uh, many scientists will distrust that broad consensus because, as a matter of fact, the stones don't don't follow that. The um, when they when they take a look at the 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 record left in the in the rock, the commonly associated accepted diameter was six point two miles of the impact. That's one big rock. It would have caused a, a mega tsunami over 100 meters, 330 feet tall, that would have reached all the way to was now Texas and Florida. So you can kind of see that the narrative itself is designed to, to please us because it's big and it's major, things are blowing up. Uh, but it may not necessarily be true. The problem with the Alvarez thesis, Alvarez thesis which was 1980, which said that, um, to go back, that their scientists were able to find a certain kind of iridium in all this area over here that suggested that some alien um, rock object had hit here. One journalist writes, science reporters cheered having a story that united dinosaurs and extraterrestrials and Cold War fever dreams. It needed, quote, only some sex and the involvement of the royal family, and the whole world would be paying attention. This was written before Megan and Harry, but you get the point and that there's a kind of way in which even the things that I'm talking about tonight, the Anthropocene, uh, is ready-made out of certain kinds of narrative parts. And so much of the work that you see about climate change is anything pays little attention to the various ways in which we can, uh, the other ways in which actually humans do affect this. Uh, we don't have any control over Amazon or its structure, that's not the other thing necessarily, but we do have a control over what we were, what we eat, where we go. Uh, so the asteroid narrative, it's easier to think of the world ending with a bang, hence this particular film, don't look up, than because there are too many Amazon trucks. Oh, yes, I want a new toothbrush, so I'll get it on Amazon, and they will send a truck out to send me a toothbrush. Does that happen? I'm, my lips are sealed. Amazon ships 2.5 billion packages a year, with billions more coming up and a major threat to UPS and FedEx, not to think about the major threat to the world. 40,000 semi-trucks, 2021. 25,000 plus semi-trucks will operate 87,000 total vehicles. Um, you're gonna see a moment in a moment where some of the, the, the major energy goes and where the, the CO2 comes from. 87,000 total vehicles to ship Amazon products around. Anyway, just saying, but here are three more recent extinction level events. This is, again, I put these in because these are the kind of material that blur through our news. The shock wave from the Tonga volcanic eruption earlier this year, January 15, 40 miles from the Polynesian Kingdom of Tonga. Uh, the Tonga of underwater volcano erupted, expelling volcanic material with energy hundreds of times the equivalent of the Hiroshima bombs. You know, it's kind of jarring to, to, to begin to now see that they're beginning to use uh, human destructive power as a comparative thing. And we're going, we're not, we're not paying attention to the narrative here. Um, there's this breathlessness about how, how, how disastrous it is. But one can understand that um, one can one can understand that the history when you go back to to Pliny, who uh, early in the 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 the, the common era was watching the the eruption of the volcano, you can see what would happen. The most recently, the volcanoes in in Hawaii, and how they can affect the land. 
as recently as 30 years ago, uh, uh, the Shoemaker Levy 9 comet, which was discovered by accident. The giant impacts are not a thing of the past, that they're a real and present threat. They are. And here you have this astonishing sequence in 1994 of a comet breaking up and hitting Jupiter. And Jupiter is a big thing. So you can imagine if something like this had hit uh, the Earth. Uh, in fact, if they look at the, the old continent Pangaea, which was all the, 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 the continents together, and you know, the, the likely possibility that the, the, the lunar mass was uh, an effect of something like this. So, um, January 18th, 2022, asteroid known as 7482 passes by Earth. So we see this kind of material. We are currently in a systemic nature exterminating all non-human living beings, the Anthropocene, Holocene era. This is an ongoing extinction. It's natural in some ways, but as new species progress to fit ever-changing ecological specific dishes, older types vanish. The rate of extinction is far from constant, and this is the issue. And at least a handful of times in at least 500 years, 75 to more than 90% of all species in the world have disappeared in a geological blink of an eye. And even in the ones, the five that we talked about, this, these things did not happen overnight. And for example, the one that killed off all the dinosaurs, probably there was about a million year period of time in which I did that. But that the, the, the climate changing and the conditions of the earth began to develop a can, can cascade so that over time an increasing numbers of extinctions happen. So the, this is an event rather than a moment. So mass extinctions happen because of a climate change, asteroid impacts, volcanic interruption, or combination of these causes. What we're talking about now, the Anthropocene adds a new driver, human agency. And by the way, the Anthropocene is not yet uh, something that is hist or it's not geologically approved. In other words, the scientists, um, they're voting on this particular name. They've, they're coming to, to agreement on it, uh, but it's not quite there yet. Now, and uh, just to toot our own little horn here, just in case you missed this in the New York Times yesterday, for planet Earth, this might be the start of a new age. A panel of experts has spent more than a decade deliberating on how and whether to mark a momentous new epoch in geologic time. Um, again, if you missed it the New York Times, you could say you saw it and heard it here first. So the working group, the Anthropocene Working Group, 34 researchers found in 2009, aim of crafting a proposal to formally recognize the Anthropocene. It would mark a clear departure from these other, uh, the Holocene, which began at the end of the last ice age. Now remember, the end of the last ice age is something like 10,000 years ago. What I called earlier the little ice age, probably 1300 to 1400 uh, common era, um, where there was a, a drop in temperature rather than a raising in temperature. But th that's a different kind of thing. I mean, that's a more casual, more, more, more systemic thing. But to define a new epoch, the researchers needed to find a representative marker in the rock to identify the point. Because in the end, it will be the rocks that have the say. The question is, did have humans left a distinctive set of marks preserved in rock, seafloor mud, or glacial ice that indicates a fundamental change? 2014, the sixth extinction on unnatural history. The ongoing sixth extinction event might be one of the most severe ecological threats to the termination of civilization, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. This was 2014 and uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Colbert works for the New York Times. So after a decade of investigating the question, the AWG decides that humans had in fact left an indelible mark. In May of 2019, 29 for the 34 members, opted to move forward with developing a proposal supporting the designation of the Anthropocene. Again, to make specific, this says that it is clear that biologically, geologically, 
human agency has affected and left its mark upon um, the diminishing capacity of this world. And a more recent vote, AWG members decided overwhelmingly to pursue a marking point in the mid 20th century. All the activity pouring unprecedented amounts of persistent organic pollutants since the Industrial Revolution and since 1945 and the nuclear into the environment ramped up the rate of animal extinctions and created geological features that have never before existed. They call this period the Great Acceleration. I know this sounds like something out of Donald Trump in January 6th, but it's, that's the language that they use. Measures of the Anthropocene, 1750 to 2000. Um, it's nice if one remembers in terms of our history. The last date was 1600, 1750. Uh, uh, you were hot in the middle of colonialism and the transfer of countries. Um, this Northern Hemisphere average temperature. Population, heavy red line. Look at that straight up, straight up. CO2 concentration, which we're talking about earlier in terms of uh, transportation. Loss of tropical rainforests, up. Motor vehicles, up. Climate designation, fisheries exploited, foreign investments. The point being, one can see that from the year 1900, even in 1950, there's a dramatic increase in changes. Humans in the extinction crisis, Population from 1800 to 2000, extinctions. Populations, extinctions. Humans outcompete other species for resources, space, even climate. Humans are classified as apex predators, but also as global super predators with their appetites outmatching any other species per capita. We may already know that there are 17 extant species of the human, 17. The Smithsonian in the, uh, the, 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 the human project, I think it's called, um, has this um, kind of sideways, well, what happened to the other 16 uh, human species that were effaced or displaced? The word for it is displaced. And basically what we're seeing is that the one species, Homo sapiens, was the species that was, was, was and remains the most aggressive. Species extinction threat grows. This is again, 2009, we've seen a lot of this. Climate change, pollution, destruction of habitats, invasive alien species. Okay, so much of this, and you can see that here from the year 1800 to 2100, population goes from 0 0.09 billion to 12 billion. Loss of species and ecosystems, minus 1.8 to minus 17%. Land area converted for human use in 1800, 7.6. 2100, 49.1%. So the golden spike, the golden spike is in fact a golden spike. GSSSP, a golden marker created by evidence of a global event that leads to long lasting global changes. When they can read this and say, in this particular time zone here, something happened. These are indicated to indicate a change in a geologic division, such as an epoch, age, or era. The two suggested for the Anthropocene, and this is what's interesting, 1610, a time where the greenhouse concentrations in the atmosphere dipped by seven to 10 parts per million. Oh, that's interesting. It, it went down, so why is this a marker? The dip was driven by sweeping man-made activities. The Columbian Exchange in 1610 was in process. New species were being introduced irreversibly into both continents. European diseases like smallpox had killed tens of millions of people in North America. Agriculture was collapsing, forests were making a comeback, absorbing more carbon dioxide. From another perspective, I want to point out how, uh, how whitewashed this whole thing is. Okay. Um, the colonialism is not mentioned. Uh, smallpox is killing off people, but not enslavement. 
that in 15, uh, 1495, Columbus uh, took five boats of uh, indigenous persons back from uh, Latino Indians from uh, the J Jamaican islands into Spain and slavery. And from that particular point, the European, uh, European slavers, uh, uh, Britain, France, Denmark, and others, they're the ones who are bringing in. So while one, well, one of the narratives is that it was European diseases like smallpox that killed uh, millions of people. The other narrative is about the enslavement of indigenous as well as African persons. 1964, the other contender for the start of the Anthropocene, the year the traces of radioactive fallout from nuclear testing reached a peak worldwide after the worldwide testing ban. Using this as a boundary would likely pass muster with geologists. It's quite visible in the record. More usefully, using 1964 as a start would help denote what some scientists have dubbed the Great Acceleration, a period over the last 50 years when economic and population growth really took off. And we've seen that in all these maps. We've seen other things right up. Um, the Columbian Exchange, Hiroshima. Now, potential points for the gold spike for the Anthropocene. East Scotland Basin, Bebu Bay, West Florida Garden Bank, Flanders Reef, Palmer Ice Sheet, Lakes, uh, uh, Shalangan Mar, China, Searsville Reservoir, US, Sniska Mountain on the Polish and Czech border. And you can see here, right here, where you can see one of the marks. Uh, to the point of our, this evening, other potential markers of the Anthropocene, plastic pollution. This stuff now hardens into rock. Aluminum and concrete particles, high levels of nitrogen and phosphate in soils derived from artificial fertilizers, abandoned concrete, a completely new human created environment. Manila Bay, fishermen float aboard a boat amid mostly plastic rubbish. Humans reduce, home humans introduce 300, meter, 300 million metric tons of plastic into the environment every year. These are mile, miles wide garbage dumps of plastic in the ocean because of the currents the plastic just goes around and around and around and around. Um, a, a friend of mine who does marine uh, animal uh, disentangling will talk about the, the amount of plastic that, that not only do they have to take off of right whales, sperm whales, seals, but the amount of plastic that they find inside these creatures. The old image of Moby Dick, for example, speaking from an American literature, where you see Moby Dick with you know all kinds of uh, harpoons and things on it. Uh, that's exactly the case, is that these animals carry with them the marks of the human um, capitalism that they see. Climate change, where the cascading collapse begins. All right, it's 7.05, I think we can do this very quickly. Uh, we know all this. Climate change is the long-term rise in the average temperature. Most of the observed warming changes since the 1950s are unprecedented for the instrumental temperature record. 2013, the Intergovernmental Panel Fifth Assessment Report, it's extremely likely that human influence has been the dominant cause of the observed warming since the mid-20th century. Code red for human-driven global heating. Human-induced climate change already affecting many weather and climate extremes. Many of these changes are unprecedented. Some of the shifts are in motion now. We've seen some, while some, such as continued sea level rise, are all already irreversible for centuries to millennia ahead. Global surface temperature has increased faster since 1970 than in any 50 year period over the last 2000 years. Uh, and you don't have to go far because this particular summer and even the last couple of months, we've seen evidences of this uh, in places where typically uh, the, the weather was 10 or 15 degrees higher. 
for example, temperatures during the most recent decade, 2011 to 2020, exceed those of most recent multi-century warm periods. Okay, to see it on the map, from 1880 to 2017. The numbers that we started with, it projects that temperatures could rise at least 3.6 Fahrenheit by the end of the century under many plausible scenarios and possibly four or more. Okay, as I noted earlier, experts considered two of the centigrade of warming to be unacceptably high. A more recent study also shows that th this particular figure is gonna be reached not by the end of the century, but by 2050. Takeaways, historical climate change is indisputably human caused. 2012, 2022 was the hottest decade in 125,000 years. And to this particular point, one say, well, so let's not worry about who did it, but how does one, either one change or, or take amends and means for the people who can't, can't bear to, to live this way. Certain changes we've already seen are irreversible. Felt right now, frontline communities around the globe, on, on shores, extreme weather, Flooding, wildflower flooding in Canada, or flooding in Canada, flooding in Kansas, wildflowers draw mid mudslides have increased in mid years. The level of the global warming reaches causes the polar polar ice caps, permafrost, to begin melting and thawing. As ice melts, it only triggers more ice melts. Greenhouse gas emissions are the leading cause of climate change. We'll talk about that in a moment. Climate events are increasing in severity and number in every region of the planet. This, we see this, we don't understand it. I'm going to, I'm going to make a point here. To, to, I'm going to compare this to, and people say, well, why don't, why don't people like Exxon and BP, why don't they, why don't people on the energy producers, why don't they simply understand what's going on and close down shop? And in the same way, for example, you go back and say into the 1860s and, and why enslavement in the United States lasted so long and why, why abolitionism didn't happen sooner. It certainly wasn't political. It certainly wasn't, it was economic. Um, I'm, I'm sorry to say it protected this way, but the people who run BP and Exxon and, and the, the global uh, commodity people of that particular thing, uh, well, they are likely not gonna be around in 2060, but you know what? Right now they're making the money. Natural drivers only. Human and natural drivers. The observed temperature. So, what what is some of these? What is some of this? Well, this uh, is a fairly blunt little graphic. This is fossil fuel. This is the total energy expended. Fossil fuel, coal, oil, nuclear, renewables, heat. I mean. Uh, water or however we do this, different kinds of things. Okay. Who uses this energy? The United States, China, Russia, Japan, biggest, 2005. United States. This is the uh, Paris Agreement, signed and ratified, withdrawn. Quite literally, the very first thing President Joe Biden did the day he was sworn into office, signs a series of executive orders, including rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, hours after his inauguration, one of the very first things that he did. The climate crisis, Biden said in his inaugural speech, one of several big challenges facing the United States and the world, to quote, during a world of peril. Future generations should be able to look back to us and say, they healed the broken land. Uh, Biden uses an expression here, the broken land, which is from a book, uh, from T Timothy Milgram's book on uh, ethics in a time of global catastrophe. He doesn't cite it or talk about it, but it's his expression, and I think it's a good one. But so the climate change affects more than human animals. And um, rarely does one see in any of this discussion of, of climate change, climate change, about how 
other than in terms of how other non-human animals, except maybe polar bears, uh, survive it. But by end centuries end, wildlife habitats could shrink by a quarter. Already mammals and birds and amphibians around the planet have seen the natural habitat shrink by 18% over just three centuries. We estimate that species have lost an average of 18% of their natural habitat and maybe lose to 23% scientists write in the new study. As we continue to expand agricultural and urban areas, the habitual size of almost all known birds, mammals, and amphibians is shrinking. And here you can kind of see where areas are that wildlife, meanwhile, is being pushed into even smaller and smaller areas. 25% of ice-free land, once considered wild, compared to 50% three centuries ago. Rates of extinction of species affected here are far above averages. So the maps that we see are, show the majority of remaining wilderness areas in the deserts of South Australia, Amazon rainforest, Tibetan plateau, and boreal snow forests of Canada and Russia. And despite their importance, wilderness areas are being destroyed at an alarming rate. We're failing to meet all the targets set for slowing down biodiversity destruction by 2012. The point of the Biodiversity Outlook Report in 2020, it warns not only of the alarming degradation of nature, but also, sorry, also points to it as a variable that increases the risk of future pandemics. Um, I've mentioned now a couple of times the bubonic plague. Uh, David Key's book, Chaos, actually looks at the way the interaction between the environment pandemic and how the, the, the back and forth between the, the, if you want to call it the weakened environmental immune system, makes it possible for the conditions in, in which the, the spread from one species to another that is uh, irreversibly dangerous. To remember, though, as we're coming to an end of what we're talking about here tonight, climate is only one cause of what one author, cited without note by, by Biden, calls the broken world. The proceedings of the Academy of Science talk about the collapse uh, of society and civilization. They pin three scenarios. And the third one, as they say, which we label global collapse, all large urban areas across the globe are virtually abandoned. Functioning nation states no longer exist, and the world's population undergoes a significant decline. This catastrophic situation is perhaps what the phrase civilization collapse evokes for most people. However, it is helpful to see global collapse as an extension of the broken world, wherein the remaining non collapse states and urban centers, which have by then become highly vulnerable, are pushed over the brink by further climate impacts, uh, what we would call failed states. And to this particular point, I wanted to point out that the United States, uh, there's a there's a, a, de a, de a, de a de democracy kind of um, watch uh, network that have, has downgraded America's, the United States' uh, uh, democratic abilities in the same kind of way that, that as different states fail in different, in different measures. Climate change then might not be an abrupt event, but rather an extended process that starts small and plays out over the course of a century or more. Non-human animals in the Anthropocene. We've talked a little bit about loss of habitat, climate, and hunting. And I want to, I'm going to spend more time thinking about the silenced partners, clothing, entertainment, food. First, some background. Human agency and indifference removes animals from their natural lives and uses them for a variety of needs and pleasures. We eat animals, we wear them, we use them for emotional support. Our beauty, health, and home products are tested on them, although they don't need to be any longer. Animals perform for us and satisfy our need for intimacy as well as novelty. Nonetheless, like them, biological taxonomies indicate that we are animals. 
1757, Linnaeus um, wrested control of um, the science of uh, the Homo sapiens from the Christian church's uh, lock on the book of Genesis, which says that in the beginning, Adam created, uh, um, Adam named all these creatures, but that Adam himself was not one. Uh, Linnaeus is, uh, in his particular work, may, basically takes the Aristotelian model of a quadruped and puts the, the human being into the family hominididae, homo sapiens. And our nearest ancestor are the bonobo and the chimpanzees, by the way. Uh, a bit more of my politics. So in all of this talk about land habitats and other sorts of things, um, I, I don't want to forget and come back to the way in which these other sentient creatures are meant uh, and mean very little to us, but, but how we use them. Some of these images are perhaps familiar with folks. How this particular bear was there, uh, there was, was so terrified by what it was doing that it essentially urinated it over itself in, in the circus. Um, <clears throat> Who would who would put fish into a context like this and then name them exotic? What does that mean? Um, th this is how our elephants become the way they are. So the, the humanity is three mega devastators that causing the sixth extinction. Climate change. We've been talking about that. Consumption of resources which includes primarily habitat destruction, human overpopulation by which every one of us increases the first two. The magnitude of what humanity is doing became apparent in the 70s, but still what we're doing at the mass extinction crisis is invisible to most of us or unaware of it or indifferent. Richard Leckie, Homo sapiens is in the throes of causing a major biological crisis a mass extinction, the sixth such event to have occurred in the past, and we homo sapiens may also be among the living dead. Uh, Ronnie Lee, founder of the Animal Liberation Front, and here's where it gets a little, um, little pointed. Mr. Lee says this, we have been at war with the other creatures of this earth ever since the first human hunter set forth with spear into the primeval forest. And I, again, I want to note here that he has some politics here. Human imperialism has everywhere enslaved, oppressed, murdered, and mutilated the animal peoples. All around us lie the slave camps we have built for our fellow creatures, factory farms and vivisection laboratories, dock aisles and buchan walls for the conquered species. We slaughter animals for our food, force them to perform silly tricks for our delectation, gun them down, stick hooks in them in the name of sport. We have torn off the wild places where once they made their homes. Speciesism is more deeply entrenched within us even than sexism, and that is deep enough. Um, all right, I'm not gonna go there. So to review, a th roughly a third of invertebrate species are experiencing declines in local population losses. It varies from group to group, depending on the taxonomic group. But of the decreasing species, many are now considered in danger. That so many common species are decreasing is a strong sign of the seriousness of the overall biological extinction episode. Here you again, you see black not threatened, red is the threatened, fish, other crustaceans, reptiles, fish mollusks. Mammals extinction, birds, vertebrae. The, the graphs say it all, but they do simplify it. And one wonders, is there a way out of all of this? I talked a moment ago about uh, the, the science between the Alvarez thesis. Uh, one scientist who, uh, she's a professor at Princeton, has been arguing for that volcanic evidence of 
um, the Jurassic is extinction. And she writes this, just think if we wipe ourselves out in the next couple of thousands of years, there will be no record left. As she studied the eroded remains of 66 million year old basalt. Said, I mean, it's a second, it's a nanosecond in history. Who will find our remains? There'll be someone going around the earth trying to figure out what happened to us, Eddie said. There'll be big debates about it. Well, we were stupid and killed ourselves on a grand scale, Keller said. You rule the world and then you die. What to do? Stop burning fossil fuels, 80% still being used. Protect half of the earth's lands and ocean. Fight illegal wildlife trafficking. Slow human population growth. 200 years ago, there was less than a billion people on earth. Today, there's 7.9 billion and our population is still growing. By the United Nations, unless we take action, there's likely to be 30% more at 11 billion people by 2100. Ecofeminism, that's my own particular take on things. Is that's like, for example, it's uh, the, the, how we, if you want to call it virtue ethics or applied to species. This is a four-year-old Southern African female white rhino attacked by poachers in 2015 with a horn on her head. She later died. In recent years, the Animal Liberation Front and the Earth Liberation Front have become the most active criminal extreme elements in the United States. Despite the destructive aspects of ALF and ELF's operations, their stated operational philosophy discourages acts that harm any animal, human, and non-human. Animal Liberation Front is one of the top 10 um, uh, domestic ter terrorists uh, in the AF, what do you call it, in, in FBI. This is Johnny Lewis, Deputy Assistant Director, Federal Bureau of Investigation. This is in 2004. That the United States certainly does protect its investments, if not in the animals, in the money that they make on selling their bodies. So it might be time to think about, as we end here, it might be time to think about that other narrative, Noah's Ark. What, did, what, do you, what was that all about? We tell the story of Genesis, but was Noah's Ark itself the story of some some kind of um, some kind of 13th, 14th century in Europe? Was it some kind of an extermination event? Something that happened that, that we have no record except um, the the mythic narrative? It might be time to think about that particular narrative and what it might mean for its own history, but now to ours. And as we end tonight, and I told Robert I'd be done in 90 minutes, and we are, I want to thank us here for the good that we do together. There's more to do. And may our children know a world that is not broken. Thank you. I want to end with one more thing. Where is it? It's not here. Oops. All right. Here it is. Oh, here it is. The Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson, um, President Obama. This is one of his, his best books of 2022. Um, and it's exactly what we're talking about. How do we take a world that's broken and take care of it, and make it better? Uh, Robert, thank you. Questions and Robert will handle that particular point. And um, this is how to get a hold of me if you need to. Um, and I'm gonna, again, thank everyone for their, their, their presence. All right, Ed, thank you. That was awesome. Appreciate that. So as usual with this program, he generated a lot of interesting questions and comments. Um, let's see. And then, Ed, we also have Patty joining us. Um, she helps out with the Hi, chat Q&A. Hi, Patty. How are you doing? I am quite well. This has been fascinating, Ed. Um, from the moment I read the title, I it just like sounded a gong in my whole body. So I would could not have missed this for the world. And uh, Robert is correct. You're drawing a lot of commentary. <laughs> Patty's the smartest person here. So she'll ask all the best questions. <laughs> um, well, we, we have at least one attendee who um, has made a number of comments about your politics and 
I think that even Robert would probably invite him to put a program together countering anything that you said, if he has that information available, right, Robert? <laughs> yeah, we always say, hey, if you don't agree with something, put your own program together. Exactly. Thank you, whoever this was for not only one being here, but for, I'm, I'm guessing, staying along. So, and it's clear I have a politic. There's no question about that. Yes, and that was one of his commentary. But I mean, you know, you can't, you have to, one cannot be human without having some political perspective. Um, and I think that, that it's an error to think that one can be uh, separated from the other. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, our group is nonpartisan and Edward has his opinions. I have my opinions, Patty has her opinions. All people's opinions are welcome. Um, Robert, Ed just wanted to share his thoughts. So Robert, we're perfect. totally good with people either agreeing or disagreeing. That's totally fine. Right, but calling something politics is not really a counter argument. <laughs> that that's I think the point of the oh yeah, well that's fine. Well yes, yeah, so there were people typing crazy stuff in the comments, but um, that's fine. Whatever. <laughs> um, I guess Edward, the biggest thing that people always ask when you do this program, oh, okay, so yeah, I agree with you. Well, what could I do about it? Um, and you've kind of talked about it um, here and there, and that's I guess that's the biggest. Question well, the, people have you know, running the, through the, the program. Is the th that, that's going to be different for different people. And it's like when I was walking through the our house and I turned to my husband, Tim, and I said, what is, what is this cow hide doing on our floor? I mean, again, this 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 archaeological of our own history is that we hadn't we had not had a, a, a we hadn't had meat over a decade, and yet there was a cow hide on our floor. Um, so we look around at the pieces of our lives that are still uh, that parts of us are inhabiting in other kinds of areas. And um, so I, when I did this last year, I spent less time talking about food and clothing. It's the way that we live. It's our kind of footprint. You know, it's like, so uh, Exxon will constantly send me things about here, go, uh, go paperless, save electricity and save energy. <laughs> but, but you're not, you're not saving, you're not saving me any money. You're keeping the money. So, but it's each one of us is going to make the decision how we're going to dress, what we're going to wear, what we're going to eat. Uh, these are small changes, clearly. Uh, we're going to make the efforts to be in places like this, to see more about this, to speak up and have a politic. Okay. Isaac Bashiba Singer, example, he said, you know, he was talking about, uh, he said to animals, uh, all, 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 all humans are Nazis. And he was a person in the camps himself. And he's making, he's making that politic to the, the way that we treat animals is exactly the same way in his mind that he was treated in the, 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 the formulating camps that they called them in, in Dachau in, in, um, in Germany or Poland. And this is so complex as most of what you talk to us about is. And we have at least one person who is seeming to struggle to connect um, colonialism to to the 400 or 500 years that followed it and kind of was making the point that um, according to your graphs, the, act, the, the greatest damage has occurred um, since or in the post-colonial, post-World War II, post-colonial era. I'm not sure if there's any way you can make that more clear. I've kind of tried to, but it's a well, continuum that builds on what already happened, right? My only point was is that they know they never mentioned that particular word, but we're still in the colonial era. There's no question about that. Um, but they do talk about the Colombian exchange as being that earliest marker. Yeah, yeah, that's. But that's it's hard to it's hard to come up with a way to explain the continuum to people. Or from from where I am, I'm yeah. I seem to be having a difficult time. And that's because uh, to be to be again be to be direct. Most of the history of colonialism has been, how do I say, politely hidden. Yeah, that, that's the truth. Yeah, I, and so I think unless we are talking about this openly and constantly, it can be very hard to connect right. um, it, point A to point B. And I think it, it's that's my kind of my point. Why I ended up with the FBI uh, notice about uh, the animal liberation people being, you know, domestic terrorists. Um, they're making a lot of money off these creatures. I'm just say that. Okay. Yeah, and somebody did point that out that it's hard to take um, 
some of these aggregate statistics, um, you have to always remind yourself that each of these groups has a vested interest and um, actually, and in I've what they're actually, doing. I have actually, that was kind of my, my, my narrative today was countering it, that here much of the emphasis is, is, is talking about land and, 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 and water, and, but they're not talking about anything that any one particular human being is doing, eating or dressing or wearing or thinking. So it, it takes the burden off us individually to think about global warming in this kind of way. Yeah, I, I mean, they come, they are constantly, this came up earlier in a different program, but they're constantly developing new language that gives us permission to not think about what we're doing. I mean, I, I do a lot of, the, I do a lot of, and you, Robert knows in terms, of the, in terms of the working, in terms of the colonial effects, in terms of Washington, D.C., and and how the, the Washington, D.C.'s own history of enslavement is nowhere in evidence in the city itself. Mm -hmm. It's astonishing. Right. And, I mean, one of the things I can't help but think about, because like I said, my family history goes back to the earliest colonial period here in New England, but I mean, it's kind of common knowledge around here that back then anybody that happened to be in prison ha tended to be fed lobster because it was so plentiful, ugly and cheap, nobody wanted to eat it. And now it's more and more becoming a delicacy that only the wealthy can afford. Um, my point on that is red lobster that we name our restaurants off, off a fish where you're boiling to death. Exactly. Yes, yeah. yes. But I, I mean, that is just like a, a beautiful synopsis of what we value when and how. Um, th there are accounts of prisoners revolting um, because they were being fed a constant diet of lobster. <laughs> it's hard to imagine now. But yeah. uh, these are the things that I don't think really people, un unless you happen to be directly involved with some of that history, I think it's easy to miss these. Yes, and, and I understand that. And it's, I'm, I'm directly involved with it because I've spent how many ever years of my life reading, reading and being, but it's, I, I can, I sympathize with most people who, who don't, who can't make that connection, who have no idea what the Colombian exchange is, for exactly, example. Exactly, yeah. When we're celebrating Columbus Day, we have, they have no sense of of the number of when they talk about the 95% genocide, that's the word the New York Times uses of Columbus's effects on the, the Tano Indians. And uh, Alvarez's book, The Other Slavery, for example, which talks about yes, the narrative is it's, it was European diseases, but as a matter of fact, it took the European colonists three or four months to cross the sea, and by that time. All the diseases would have been, you know, whatever. But they're not paying any attention to the other ways in which uh, European colonists uh, effectively, and you go back to California and the missions, the effective genocide of, of the of the indigenous people. Not to mention, since you're the, speaking about the New England, the the the, the, the enslavement of uh, twelve uh, five million indigenous people persons in the colonies, which is not itself talked about. So um, there's, there's a lot of not talking going on. So I'm um, probably be for Yeah, or invention of narrative and or language that yeah. allows us to not talk about the, the reality of it. Well, that's what I meant by it, that don't look up the narrative of the asteroid. It's much easier to think about boom than to think about that the, the toothbrush that's coming on my Amazon truck is yeah. <laughs> Yes. And that itself is an obscenity. I mean, this idea that somebody understood that they could become massively wealthy by catering to your desire to have whatever you want in a moment without That's having to lift much more than a finger. I was going to say, you know what? Uh, and you know, you just, everyone out here knows somebody who got a toothbrush off Amazon and his truck came and delivered it. Yes. Whatever there's a need. That's what capitalism is. Exactly. But but the, it seems to me that there is a logical endpoint. It's just that we we have trouble imagining that endpoint. Well, the and, logical endpoint is the anthropocene of what they're talking about. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Because we can always rationalize, well, my little toothbrush isn't making that much of a difference. When the last, um, elephant, when the last elephant we have is that poor creature that, that can move around 30 or 40 feet in the DC Zoo. 
Okay, we'll say, well, we can say, well, we're we're keeping it for the next generation. Yeah. At the same time that we were eviscerating its own homeland. Mm. It, it this is so, so amazingly um it, it's sad but it, it's also like I, I can't even describe the internal feeling that it creates in me to be thinking about all this i mean it, it's it's like oh my god why can't we understand that we're exploding ourselves i i just have never been able to grasp that basic disconnect well i would encourage all anyone who, who took the time to be here They've already done the good work. They're, they're here because they're making up their own minds. They're going to get me out of their head and go find a book and find something. And that book is going to lead them to something else. And I, I, all of us value the steps that we take, however small they are. Right. And that's the only thing you can do. I mean, is to become co as conscious as, as we can as individuals and to try to convey the message in um, the most effective way possible, which is not going out and becoming a terrorist organization, but um, by example and and by um, early on, somebody was talking about having trouble hearing you. And I said, well, that's because Ed speaks in a soft voice. <laughs> and I, I think that's very effective. It, it creates a, a climate in which people can hear you and listen to you. Um. I will talk louder. No, no, you're. That's what I'm saying. It's a good thing. You're not shouting. You're you're drawing us into a really important message. Again, but the important takeaway is that people are here because we all of us need to know. Uh, our life depends on what we know. And yeah. if they are, if, if capitalism is hiding the connection between Amazon's toothbrush and the destruction of the environment. Okay, I mean, they, 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 someone has to uncover that. So, uh, Karen is just making a good point. And um, it, it's hard sometimes when you're in dialogue with people, but colonialism is privatization of water, occupation of indigenous lands, and robbing them of their resources. Colonialism is ignoring our treaties with native peoples, et cetera. So yeah, she's making that connection. We tend to think of colonialism um, in very mundane terms of like, oh, I went to a different place and enslaved the people or or took over the land. Um, it, it's far more um, obsequious than that. It, it pervades all aspects of capitalism, I think. Uh, yes. And what ignoring ignoring treaties is one thing. Setting out uh, deliberately to uh, violate them was as Andrew Jackson, who was known as the Indian Killer, or uh, Washington uh, General Washington, who was called the Town Leveler by the Seneca, Seneca Indians, or by uh, Jeffrey Amherst of University of Amherst, who who threw um, smallpox blankets into the uh, indigenous camps. Yeah, even this session of the Supreme Court, um, there's a case on the docket um, that uses an approach through um, Indian child welfare to, the, the goal is to open up um, possibilities for, for corporate use of Indian land, but it's one of those backdoor approaches. And unless you're constantly aware of the various machinations that are happening, you, you just don't see it. Right. It sounds like a good thing, but really it's a backdoor approach to gaining more. Wow, thank you for that one. Yeah, I was just reading about it this morning and I, I would give you the reference, but I'm not sure. It might've been in the Boston Globe, but I, I'm not positive. Um, hey, Robert, are we okay? I know you have a, you have a, you said we had a oh yeah no okay I'm just listening so um are you going to continue when you did this before there was this was the first of a three part series are you going to do that again because um for myself personally this really had a big impact on me I went from eating meat once a day um, to only twice per week and so I reduced my meat contact or intake by um let's see five meals a week. Uh, or 250 meals a year. So I feel like I've saved a lot of animals um, by eating meat 250 fewer times than I did before your program. So are you gonna continue on with parts um, two and three? 
laughing about the politics because the next one that you and I had talked about was the the invention of white people. Um, so, <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, we can talk about when when we get together, Robert. We will sort out the schedule for that. But yes, okay. So yeah, in, in times past, just for our audience, this was the first of a three part series that Edward did on the environment. And this, these are interesting programs because they really generate a lot of, of discussion amongst the audience. Sometimes when we do our other regular programs, just people just kind of sitting, uh, listening with, for whatever reason, this one draws a whole lot of uh, questions and comments and opinions from people. Right. And and it, again, Sheila just made a comment that points out how how challenging it can be to expand our grasp of what's going on because she's she says dental floss from Amazon, but what would the environmental cost be if I jumped in my car? Um, yes, I did order, order dental floss unavailable in Toronto market. I think, though, what we tend not to think about is making dental floss the one thing you need and then needing something different tomorrow, as opposed to um, aggregating one's needs and and trimming them to a reasonable uh, or or to a necessary um, scale. Um, you know, as opposed I, to, I need it now and I want it tomorrow. Um, the more work each one of us does at reducing our own our own little footprints, however we do that, however we do whatever work we do to to take to to ensure that more creatures have more possibilities, whether it's feeding the birds, border, whatever, whatever, and I think helping our children and my mother. I'm going. I'll end this by saying. My mother started me on this when my father gave me a BB gun for my, you know, I was, I was like, I was like eight or nine or ten, um, and you know, it was, I, I took it out the back and was, and my mother opened the window and just says, you know, what Edward, what the hell are you doing? Part my, you know, I, we don't know we're doing anything wrong until someone tells us. Exactly, we need the language. But you know what? I learned. I learned from my mother. That, that little creature had as much right to be out there than I, as I did. And here I am. I'm, st I'm, st I'm still yammering about that. No, I agree. I mean, I grew up on a farm. So, uh, I mean, that connection between the animal and the people has always been very present to me. But by the same token, you don't do mass killing just for the sake of killing. Um, and that's part of what is easy to lose. I, I will. Uh, I like the Jane. I teach uh, ethics in different co contexts, and I like the the Jane approach. Who who take their broom like this out so that they don't uh, kill any insects. Um, well, that may that may not be a Western way of handling things, but um, the more I think, as we together, the more we can look at the way that we live and understand the question of need. And the greatest need is is the need to live, and we can. When Aristotle talks about that all human creatures, all creatures, all sentient creatures uh, have a need to endumia, to have a need to thrive. Well, uh, do we allow thriving in our lives for ourselves? Do we allow it for other people? Do we allow it for our children? Do we allow it for the animals? You know, we, do we put our doggies in cages and say, well, they like the cage? Maybe they don't like the cage. Do we talk to them about that? And do we even think of so many of the things we take for granted in ethical terms? Do we do we allow that space and time in our life, right. in our lives, um, to allow ethics to come to bear, not just, you know, well, that's what happens next. Um, I, I, to me, that has felt for a long time like a great loss in the culture. So, Patty, you should be doing one of these yourself, and I'll come listen to you. I, I love talking. We're with working you. on that. <laughs> so with that, we have to wrap up our program because we actually have another program starting in 15 minutes. So I want to thank everyone for joining us. Thanks, Patty, for your contribution once again. And of course, oh, happy most holiday thanks season goes to you, to every, Edward, everyone. for sharing your knowledge with us. So thanks, oh, Edward. Well, thanks, everyone. Assalamu peace to everyone. Good night to you yes. all. Blessings all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Have a great Good weekend. Night. See you Bye. soon, Robert. <laughs>